Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. G'day and welcome to my nightmare edition of Thrash and Treasure, the torture chamber musical comedy podcast that's a touch of silly with a dash of sass and a pinch of insight, creating a recipe for disaster. And speaking of disaster, I'm Bootylicious, and I'm also Aaron, <laughs> and I'm joined, as usual, by the master baker from Team Metal, he's Sensei Evan of the dojo. <laughs> How are you doing? Master baker, that's what you went with. <laughs> oh, did I say master? I meant to say master. Oops, my bad. <laughs> Anyways, how's your week been? Quickly? <laughs> yep, uh, really busy. We got, we got a new tattoo. Oh, you can't really see Oh, it. you did get a new tattoo. Oh, wow. I heard a rumor. Just my wife and mine initials, and she has one as well on the other arm, so yeah. Oh, that is so sweet. I can puke. <laughs> Anyways. Well, um, my family, my nephew first got it, and then my mum and dad, my dad was meant to go to hospital to have half his bladder removed, but they've all got COVID. So I've been a single father of five. My dad at 81, my mum at 74, my nephew at 12. The cat is about 10 years old and a six-month-old puppy. I am so tired, Evan. It is not funny. My body is sore. There are knots in places. I never knew I had muscles because I'm a skinny runt. But anyway, so... But, but wait, so, so Aaron, do you have it right now? Or you, you've, you've avoided it? At the moment, I don't know because I've had the sniffles and stuff and we've run out of rats. So I can't actually test myself. They're in the front end of the house. I'm in the back end doing all the cooking and cleaning and everything after them and the personal butler. Uh, but anyways, guess what? What? We have another legendary diva at the tea party today. And my family may have COVID, but I'm the one barely breathing from excitement. <laughs> Besides bursting with bewilderment because this brilliant bloke broke into the biz with his self-titular ill debut album, which gave us reasons for living with his mellifluous mixture of melancholy and mouth-on-fire melodies that melted magically from this mercifully model-esque muso, and in between his many EPs, albums, live albums, singles, he left us humming with delight, hearing his tunes when tuning into Friends, Party 5, Alias, Beverly Hills 90210, Riverdale, Glee, Girls, Boys and Girls, Three to Tango, Teaching Miss Tingle, The Saint, What a Girl Wants, and meeting these great expectations granted him a home at the end of the world where he scored Colin Farrell. Hey, that's my job. Oh, wait, scored that Colin Farrell film. Phew. But it's Mr. Guest's musical theatre contributions that have added fuel to this legend's earthbound starlight on the wheel of time and good fortune. So can I please buy a vowel and a huge Aussie g'day in the noir as the spring awakening on the twelfth night that American psycho Nero the Nightingale went after Bob, Carol, Ted, Carol, Bob, Alice, Dr. Scott, Rocky, because of Win dixie leaving her copy of Alice through the chosen musical at the Whisper House, where Carson McCullers talks about love. Lo and behold, that says it all. Everyone everywhere won't be out of order if our little hands rubbed out, ill. A warm welcome to the torture chamber, to this Grammy and Tony award-winning 90s teen heartthrob, who left us on a high with his number one dance hit, only for his best musical Tony winner to literally kill children and bum us all out again. So before my border collie turns into a melancholy, <laughs> it's time to pull up the white limousine for this singer, songwriter, composer, musician, writer and actor whose performance as well-dressed man helps him live up to his name because not only is he chic as fuck, he's also the bicycle thief, Mr. Duncan Sheik. Yay, welcome to the torture chamber. How are you going? Wow. Can I, can I use that as my bio from here on out? Please do. <laughs> I think you'll find it won't fit. Yeah, it probably won't fit. It's like seven <laughs> pages long, all handwritten. <laughs> and goodness gracious me. Well, it's, it's very impressive. And I appreciate the deep cuts such as they are. Yep. Thank you very much. 
because that was my sort of, you know, my teen years of, of listening to pop music and watching Friends and, and all the latest teen movies, even teaching Miss Tingle, which nobody saw, but I did. And I had the DVD and I had the one sheet poster and everything. And sort of at the time, though, obviously you were a, a male pop star. I was a soon to be gay kid. So I was listening to the Spice Girls thinking that if everyone heard me listening to Pretty Ladies, they'd all think I was straight. So <laughs> that uh, didn't work out very well in the end. And I probably should have been listening to more boys, but it's like Savage Garden. I avoided. So no, I'm not gay. I'm not listening to Savage Garden. For whatever reason, you still listen to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That might, have, that might have given some of it away. But anyway, here we are. <laughs> Possibly the melancholy, I think, because your music is very moody compared to a lot of like boy pop that was being released at the time. That was yeah. the Backstreet Boys and not to, not to uh, denigrate them, like Hanson. You would not catch me dead listening to Hanson. It wasn't until I became a punk with a mohawk and tattoos and piercings that I would wear a Hanson T-shirt purely out of irony. But, yeah, it's, it's kind of unavoidable to come across Duncan. Yeah, like listening through your back catalogue, I was like, oh, yeah, I know that song. Oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it's, you've, you've encountered it somewhere in, in your life. You really kind of, kind of avoided it. Um, well, it's, it's cool because, I, you know, honestly, I've, I've never been to Australia or New Zealand. And I know that I, you know, at, at certain points have sold a decent amount of records and songs were on the radio a fair amount. And uh, and so it's interesting to hear that perspective because, you you know, you probably were inundated with more of it than even American audiences at a certain point. So I apologize for my <laughs> sordid past. That's fine. Look, there is much worse things that Americans can apologize to the rest of the world for. That is very much the least of it. Because music does yes. bring joy at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah, I'd just like to give a sort of blanket apology for all of the behavior of our various governments over the past 200 plus years. And let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and the circus keeps rolling on. But anyways, you've just opened Noir. Uh, I believe in Texas, right? Yeah, in in Houston. Oh, Houston, awesome. One day I hope to go to Texas and ride a cowboy. Anyways, mm. moving on. <laughs> there are a lot of them in Texas. Not so much in Houston, but, uh, you know, they, they'll probably put on a cowboy outfit for you if that's what you request. You hear that, listeners? You know where my Twitter is. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. So how is the show going? We won't talk about my love life. Uh, we just had the opening uh, last Thursday, and uh, it was really beautiful and cool and exciting and an incredible cast. Uh, Darko Treshnak, the director who did uh, Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder and Anastasia more recently, uh, he did an extraordinary job with the show. My co-writer, Kyle Jero, who I wrote Whisper House with, he's, uh, he's a real badass. And he wrote an incredibly interesting and, and sophisticated and complicated plot which you don't, you know, you don't necessarily see that in musicals that often. So what I like about the show is that uh, it, you know, hopefully people like the music and the choreography and the staging, but the, the, it's the storytelling that really sort of drives it, um, which, which is, you know, I won't say it's a new experience for me, but it's new to have the focus so much on the story. Yeah, because obviously um, Spring Awakening was very much like a, a rock concert with the um, cast holding their microphones and stuff. So I don't know. I've never seen it because I love the music. And so if I love it, a cast album, I will wait to get to see it on stage. And I haven't had a chance yet to see it on stage because we haven't had a professional tour. So. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's it's, I mean. I, weirdly, because American Psycho was was in Australia before Spring Awakening, which doesn't make any sense. But um, I heard it was a cool production, so I'm happy that that, that made it there yeah. to, to Sydney. We we did do Spring Awakening a fair while ago, pretty early on. Yeah, we've covered it on this show, and there has been professional productions in Australia with the Melbourne Theatre Company, I think, and the Sydney Theatre Company, I believe, did it, who also... I think they did American Psycho. I'm not sure. Either way, there hasn't been a full proper tour, which is what I look for because I want to see what they're getting on Broadway. Yeah. And yeah, that was another one where I haven't seen any 
uh, I, apart from the clips that were out there, haven't haven't tried to you know look for a copy because I I loved it that much. I want to see it. That's great. I mean, I'm sure you know. Fingers crossed, there'll be a, a you know a, a sort of quote unquote high end professional production in Australia soon enough. Uh, I you know we just did a new one in London that Rupert Gould. The, the American Psycho director directed, and uh, that that may do some touring. It's a very cool, different version. So you know we'll see how it plays out. Awesome. Now uh, we'll keep on to the rock theme. What would be in your dream crazy rock star rider? I mean, over the top, not not anything that you've already got. Um, and I hope it's that grand piano because that is beautiful. We can only see like the butt end of it on the on the yeah. screen, listeners, but. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, it's that a, is gorgeous. Yep. No, uh, jealous. It's a 19, I think 11 ish uh, Steinway O. It sounds, oh, sounds good. My God. You hear, you hear it on a, a decent number of my recent records. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I digress. What is on my dream rider? You know, it's been so long since I've made a rider. And I sort of prided myself on a super minimalist rider when I, you know, during, uh, you know, during those sort of heavy touring times, which would have been sort of the aughts, I think, when I was touring a lot, mostly. And it was sort of like, you know, uh, it was like four bottles of Pellegrino, two bottles of Pinot Grigio, some cheese, some bread. <laughs> uh, that that was that like at that time that was yep. sort of the, the it was the minimalist you know liquids from from Italy yep. and maybe cheese from France and bread from France. That's it. No <laughs> wild animals. No, I mean you know again I, you know if I if I were to put some things on there now it would be like is there a like a, a local. Um, sort of a uh, swami like a hindu swami who can sort of give me a sermon yeah there we're talking <laughs> <laughs> i want craziness as over the top as possible <laughs> i don't know i uh and you know you know like a like a, a three hour long sort of deep tissue massage might be good uh oh duncan that's what i need right now mate <laughs> oh my god fathers get me a, a swami and a massage and i'm happy <laughs> Yeah. yeah, anyway, so those are what spring to mind at the moment, but here we are. Awesome. Now, have you had any experience with metal, heavy metal, glam metal, new metal? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, okay, probably more than people would suspect. Going back to my early childhood of, of musical influences, I mean, I started playing guitar when I was five. I mean, I won't say that I was like particularly good. I was just sort of, you know, enraptured by it. And I had a, an older cousin who was maybe six or seven years older than myself, maybe eight years older than myself. And he was sort of a, a reprobate in New Jersey. And he would give me these dissertations on sort of Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and then like Black Sabbath. And and sort and actually in these dissertations that would give me about those particular bands, he would talk about how sort of the encroaching hair metal that was coming was like just so egregious and problematic and you know wrong. So again, I, I you know I didn't I took all of this in in a very amorphous kind of way, but I did listen to a fair amount of Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. Black Sabbath, and th and then some weird things like the Michael Schenker group, obviously like the Ozzy Osbourne solo stuff. And, and then something happened where I kind of broke away from metal and moved more into like prog rock. Uh, and that, that it kind of became more about Yes and Genesis and Peter Gabriel and King Crimson and bands like that. And then that sort of like brought me over into art rock. So the trajectory was definitely like metal stuff yep. into prog rock and then into, into sort of more art rock. And of course, like Rush was in there as well because there's, they sort of straddle all those worlds. So, yeah. yeah. Um, am I correct in saying that you've covered a Rammstein song on one of your albums or something? Evan mentioned this. I have no idea. We've done Rammstein twice and 
way over my head. It, yeah, I I was listening to your um uh, live at the cafe Carlisle album, and yeah, uh, somewhere in there it's like, hang on, this is freaking Ramstein. So yeah, yeah, there's a Ramstein cover in there. There's there's a, a Radiohead cover in there as well. Well, there's a Radiohead cover. There's a there's a Depeche Mode cover called Stripped, and I don't know, maybe Ramstein might have covered stripped as well oh. i mean that's the only thing that i can sort of imagine that that might be but yeah oh yeah, well depeche Mode wrote, wrote the song it's on black celebration in 1985 or 86 that record came out and then i i, I could imagine rammstein doing a cover of that song and then i covered it much later 2011 uh, so i'm thinking that might be it but I, i'm not sure yeah so i'm not wrong evan's wrong yeah i'm i'm, I'm wrong. completely comfortable with that one <laughs> so anyways we'll move on i also had a sort of an industrial music phase yeah. too when i was in high school so like i'm stitching now about and and like uh front 242 and and ministry and things like that i was listening to so romstein is sort of one you know one degree of separation from those bands yeah so yeah I mean, yeah not that i have any idea but i say yep as if i do know well that's all right <laughs> there's the metal in me that i heard that cover and went oh that's a rammstein song but it's not that's actually really good to know that rammstein and i have one you know important thing in common that we've both covered a depeche mode song from either ends of the spectrum <laughs> <laughs> yep this week evan's chosen alice cooper's welcome to my nightmare so i've written a review would we like to hear it oh i'd love to hear it do i have to <laughs> yes you do well I, actually i'm this week I'm, I'm i'm hoping you actually love this uh well i thought you know what this is so different he'll love it don't hold your breath <laughs> when i first saw the cover i thought maybe this joke has run its course i ignited spotify and got a glass of water just in case first up welcome to my nightmare Mine, not his, on account of a certain bastard breaking up with me. Devil's food cake is on the menu next, which is lucky when one has just been dumped. By the next song, The Black Widow, they're talking about you, Stephen. Some folks <laughs> was cheeky and sleazy, whereas Stephen's just a sleazy cheater. He <laughs> makes my skin crawl. <laughs> Only women bleed unless they just got dumped. Right, Stephen? But after so many modern songs, it was nice to dive into a period piece. <laughs> Department of Youth straddles the line between classic rock and roll and sleazy stadium anthem without ever crossing the line. Unlike you, Stephen, you know what you did. Cold <laughs> Ethel, called Stephen more like, shit. Years ago was next. And also, how long ago I pressed play on this album. <laughs> next up, <laughs> him. Ugh. Minus three stars, because Stephen. <laughs> but as the awakening hit, I realised I don't need him. I'm better off without his drama, <laughs> especially when there's so much drama and flair on this album. And Escape has been correctly put as the final track, so <laughs> I too can make my escape from this four-star album. And fuck you, Stephen. <laughs> So, yeah, this was quite fun. Oh, okay. But the record is, is sort of from the perspective of this Stephen character, right? Isn't that, isn't that the case? Yeah. I don't know, Duncan. I do not pay attention to lyrics. Okay. It is a problem that I have that is ongoing yeah. on this oh, show that God. it's very hard for me to pay attention to lyrics. But I, I quite liked this. It was very rock and roll, and it straddled that line between sleazy metal, sleazy almost glam and rock and roll but with this gothic flavor and vincent price i mean you can't go wrong yeah. vincent price suddenly just talking out of nowhere for five minutes and then the music started up again and then he continued talking again and i'm like they're so high on drugs right now i am all in for this because it is so sleazy that i am i've caught the bug somehow and i know alice cooper obviously poison oh god and feed my frankenstein why is that song poison his most listened to song which because i honestly like i know some early alice cooper stuff fairly well because i had some records when i was a kid but i yeah. didn't that's a later song right like from the late 80s yeah and it's sort of like 
again, did Paradise City come out before or after that song? Probably before. That would have been 89. Yeah. So, I mean, they sort of share the same DNA in terms of that guitar riff. And I'm like, what, like, why is that song his most popular song? Was it just a big hit at the time or? Yeah, I think it was just a random hit, but yeah, he he does sort of genre jump a lot through his career, and and he did, he's done quite industrial albums. He's like Love It to Death is more of a disco album. Oh, really? Yeah, he. Some people call it you know bandwagon jumping, whatever's popular at the time. He'll sort of do an album kind of like that, depending on the producer he has. Yeah, it went for a '90s sound because that's the sound that was going. It was right, he was going. That was Terminator Two at the time. Like that yeah, sort of music was big, but it was it was in a movie or something. It was in a soundtrack or something. Or um, oh, he was in Wayne's World, but he did feed my Frankenstein, which is how I know that song. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know it from any other way. Yeah, so. no, because I always thought that like Schools Out or I'm 18 would have been like the 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 biggest songs in the catalog but they're and they're up there but but that song is way like it's you know orders of magnitude many more millions of spins which i found interesting looking at spotify today yeah schools out i also know so i'm familiar with those big anthems but yeah what's there we have what are we looking at schools out there it is schools out oh okay oh it's a school desk that you lifted up yeah cool it actually folds out into a desk oh does it that's so daggy i love it (laughs) (laughs) which i'm not going to do because no one's folded this one and it's like this is an original 1970 freaking oh wow whatever it was i had that record i mean i remember having i was i lived in hilton head south carolina in 1978 so i had that record in my record collection at the time yeah, no, it, it's, but I, I love that there is that genesis of rock and roll, that 50s rock and roll flavor to this, because you don't expect it looking at him because he is quite gothic in, well, I, I'd say gothic, but more like clownish goth in sort of the way he's, you know, acting. Yeah, it's a fair amount of comedy involved. Yeah, yeah, there, there is a, a theatrical. So you, you entirely missed the, the point of the album. Didn't get a, a story out of it. Apparently not. Oh, God. <laughs> Evan, why don't you give us a precise of the of the sort of concept behind the record? And that would Yeah, well basically, I mean, Welcome to My Nightmare is, is often regarded as one of the few concept albums that actually works as a concept album. So many people have tried it and it they're just it'll the half of it'll work. The other half won't. Um, but yeah, the Welcome to My Nightmare is what you look at when you say when you I want to make a concept album, you you start there. Well, okay. How dare you insult Tommy on my show, Evan? <laughs> yeah, there's a few different few different theories of, of what it's actually about. Um, he he long said, "Oh, it's it's about whatever you get from it." Your takeaway is that's what it is. Um, he's then said in later recent, more recent interviews that um, it, the basic idea is that Stephen's going through different nightmares. Basically, Stephen and Stephen, the character of Stephen is your inner child. Uh, yeah, that's the basic rundown. They, they turned this album into a, a TV special where they filmed a separate music video for every song and put the whole album together and you could sit there and watch the whole album. A video album? Pro shot. A video album. Pro shot's like yeah. a thing. <laughs> well, it is. A, this is a musical, really. This album is a musical. Yeah. And he has written it as a musical. Um, mm. Again, interview only a few months ago was uh, they said it's written. There is a play written. The music's done. Everything's ready to go. They just need, they just want someone to put it on Broadway or West End or wherever. It is ready to go as a, as a musical. We now have purpose in life. <laughs> in 75, yeah, they filmed, they filmed the entire thing um, with all the costumes and theatrics and, you know, top hat skeletons with canes dancing and all that. But that's credited as the first uh, music videos. I, that, that makes total sense that somebody like Alice Cooper would accidentally start this in, entire genre mm. of, of sort of artistic expression and then not get any credit for it on some level. Yeah. You know, it's like nobody, I mean, yeah. pe- you know, people think about the Buggles, you know, Trevor Horn's band was the first video killed the radio star on MTV. I, so yeah. people like think about that, you know, as a sort of an originator of a thing, but it makes total sense that Alice Cooper would, would have done that before. And he, he started so many things like there'd be, 
the music industry without Alice Cooper would be a very different place. Like there would be no Kiss, there would be no yeah. probably Motley Crue. There would be there's so many bands that the glam for God's sake. That's this is kind of where it started. The the long hair and the costumes and yeah. you know he was accused of being a, a transvestite and all sorts of things because nobody had ever seen it before. You know he, who is this weirdo on stage in crazy costumes doing crazy shit that doesn't age. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's looked the same my whole life. Yep. Yeah. And he's still, what is he now? 74 years old and he's touring as we speak. He's my mom's age. Um, yeah. My mom's age too. Yeah. And, and my mom is sort of like Alice Cooper in the sense that she's just like the energizer bunny. <laughs> too. Like she's still <laughs> yeah. just like going. <laughs> my mom's like Alice Cooper in that she's ghoulish. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. My, I mean, that's 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 probably where the comparison ends. Like yeah. they're both very energetic, and then that's about it. <laughs> I think that I was. This is my main point of connection with Alice Cooper. It personally, I did one of the VH1 Fairway to Heaven events, which is like a golf event that they do in Las Vegas. I don't know if it was '98 or '99, somewhere in there. Because I grew up in Hilton Head, South Carolina, it's like a sort of a golf resort. I played golf since I was a kid. I'm not that great of a golfer, but in terms of the rock world, I'm pretty good. Yeah. So, and and Alice Cooper is a major golfer. So I'm 99% certain he was on that particular event that year. But um, but I didn't. I mean, I didn't like hang out with him. But we played the same golf course same time wow so your, your claim to fame duncan <laughs> <That's true>. yeah. <laughs> yeah my brush with the cooper <laughs> yeah. he is legendary and he's another figure like ozzy osbourne that even if you don't know his music you know him you know his name or his look you know that impact that he's had and you know he's done musical theater obviously with um jesus christ superstar although that the king herod role is very much a role for someone like that that it's a, a stunt casting role. So I wonder how he would go in a different part. He's got a few different voices and, and there's some, I mean, you listen to only, only women bleed. That's, that's such a, a beautiful song. And yeah, back then. And as far as I can tell, his voice hasn't changed much. You know, in the early days there was, I was watching some live stuff and his voice was really not up to scratch, but could he do like Sweeney Todd? Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Probably, probably. No, I mean, look, here's what I'd say about that. You know, uh, listening to this, listen, I'm a sucker for sort of any record that was made in 1975. Like that is to me is sort of like a golden period of recording technology where everything was going to tape, but it was going to tape like pretty cleanly. And they're just, they got the drum sounds sorted out. And there were sort of cool guitar tones of various kinds in the mix. And then, you know, great acoustic guitar recording things. And it's just like a pretty, you know, whether you like the songs from that era or not, the recordings tend to sound pretty fucking great. And then, of course, Bob Ezrin producing that record, you know, he's like, you know, it just doesn't sort of doesn't get any better than than that as a producer from that era and i noticed that even you know tony levin played bass on that record or some of the songs and tony levin from he was peter gabriel's bassist and played in king crimson and uh it's just like this sort of incredibly amazing kind of uh zelig figure in music who's played with you know all of these great artists mm -hmm. so it's it, it's an interesting record because you know it was his first solo album right it was his first yeah Yep. Like he he sort of left the, the band, so to speak, and did this, yep. did a concept record with Bob Ezrin. And for that, for all that, like the sound quality is incredible. And I do think it's interesting what you were talking about in terms of his voice, because he does have this quite nice sort of quiet kind of folk singer voice when he needs to have it. And then, you know, he sort of goes into this more, rockest sort of i don't know sort of screechy place that's not necessarily my cup of tea but i know how why it's effective so you know does he have that other voice that is like i'm on stage and i'm gonna sing sort of quasi legit and my pitch is gonna be perfect like pr probably not he's using what he has 
in in a variety of ways really well. <laughs> yeah, that's how I would yeah. say. You know, a master craftsman. Yeah, that's the cleanliness of the recordings. I, I guess you may not have l- listened to his first two albums because they were shocking. They were terrible quality. It wasn't until he hooked up with Bob yeah. Ezra and that yeah. that everything came together. Um, and that was going to bring up. But he, he's collaborated with him many times and um, over his history because I'm. Full disclosure, I'm a massive Alice Cooper fan, always have been. I've listened to everything multiple times. There's no money involved here. You don't need to disclose that, we presume. So, <laughs> No, I'm just saying I ha- I'm familiar with every song, every word, every note. And you can clearly hear the difference between a Bob Ezrin album and any other producers. That, you know, the Bob Ezrin albums, all of his best classic albums have been Bob Ezrin ones. He just, yeah. he gets Alice Cooper. He gets what he wants to do and, and helps him do it. And it, the, it's one of the few times you can really hear the influence of a great producer. Yeah. I think of Bob Ezrin for his era. I mean, obviously they're making completely different music, but like somebody like Nigel Godrich, who just every record he makes, no matter who it's with, it always sounds fucking awesome. I have no idea. That's way over my head. He's the Radiohead producer, but has worked with, you know, oh, okay. yeah. Paul McCartney and has worked with the Divine Comedy and, and you know, whatever, and Beck, anything he touches is sort of really gorgeous so i think you know you can say mutt lang is sort of like a somewhere in between a bob Ezrin and a nigel godrich you know anyway there's yeah. it's interesting how certain producers yeah. have this ability to just make anything sort of sound at, as good as it possibly can um he's one of those people for sure yeah. uh queen you know queen's producer it's, I'm, I'm going to space his name right now, but, you know, another person like that who just was able to sort of like find the essence of them and make it sound incredible as a recording, distinct from, you know, what they might have been live or anything else. So, yeah. yeah and in, in terms of uh, you're mentioning the the musicians that Alice Cooper plays with, like he, he has this reputation for demanding perfection or well, not perfection, mm. but playing with top notch musicians across the board right through his career. You know, it's, and and he's collaborated with damn near everybody of, of legendary status. You Steve Vice, you Joe Satriani, you Slash, you, yeah. know, you name it. He, yeah. He's done recordings with all of them. And yeah, to, to say that you you have played with Alice Cooper, been in part of his band, is is a hell of a freaking trophy to put on your wall. Yeah, yeah I'm sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was quite cool to sort of listen to this record, which I didn't know. I didn't. I mean, I, I'd heard it before somewhere in the midst of time, but it was kind of interesting to hear it again in this context. And I really did sort of appreciate, you know, especially the production. And yeah, I mean, things like you know, only women bleed, where again. If, you know, as just purely as a song, and again, I think that this was sort of a cover or he rewrote it with some other songwriter, I believe is it's, it's a, it's a, it's a co-write. I'm pretty sure. From Frost and the Bossman. That's it. Yeah. So, so he, he, he sort of took this song and, and reconfigured it and, you know, in, listening to it now in 2022 and as somebody who's very, you know, I, I like to think that I'm aware of sort of virtue signaling and when people are paying lip service to feminist ideals and when they really need it. Like, it's sort of like this sort of ham-fisted attempt to say, like, men are bad, you know, and we treat women terribly, <laughs> but it's really so sort of like clunky as, as a lyric. But I, I appreciate that, you know, he's doing the best he can, um, you know, in terms of the times and the circumstances. That was the 70s, so that's pretty progressive for back then. It is, it is, yeah. The, the stories, the story of the, you know, the deadbeat husband um, and the wife, you know, feeding him on anything she can and, you know, just putting up with it. That's, it's such a universal story. It's, it's you know, happens fucking million times a day. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And it, it, it has ever been thus. And sadly, it continues to be thus. But I just think now, you know, we sort of shine a light on it in a, in a more, you know, in a, in a, in a more clear way. Although sadly, there's, you know, the fact that people try to shine a light on it, there's pushback against that in this day and age, but we don't have to get political right now. (laughs) Well, we'll need to put a dollar in the jar. But anyways, (laughs) it looks like Alice has flown the coop. (laughs) We're going to go to an ad break. Oh, we'll move on.
G'day listeners, Aaron here. Because Evan and I are stuck in Australia, we thought we'd better send a spy to Broadway to check out the shows for us. So here for today's review is our Broadway spy, Spencer. Up next is the revival of Stephen Sondheim's Company. This revival is beautifully directed by Marianne Elliott, and she has done things to this show that are just fantastic. This, in my opinion, is what a revival of a show should be. It should be a reimagining. It just shouldn't be the exact same thing of every other production. I think this revival demonstrates that beautifully with the gender swapping. Yes, it's a transfer from London, but they did change a lot after that with Sondheim himself, and he was involved with all of the lyric changes, all of the book changes. Now let's talk about the cast of this show. Up first, we have Patti Lapone. There's nothing to say about Patti Lapone that you haven't already heard. This is the best role in her career. She is at her best in this show. The Ladies Who Lunch gets a standing ovation every single performance, and she also is a member of the ensemble in this show and seems to be enjoying it a lot. She deserves that Tony nomination all the way. Then we have Katrina Lank, who unfortunately did not get nominated, but I saw her twice in this show, and the first time I saw her, I was not impressed by her voice, but she had improved a lot over the four months that I didn't see her, and that's what you should do when you're in a show for a long time, is improve in that role, and she is leading this show with such power. The three what are now boyfriends in this show are hilarious in You Can Drive a Person Crazy. Bobby Conte's Another Hundred People is fantastic and masterful. The set for this show is one of the coolest things ever. Going in and out of the stage, it was copied for the Super Bowl, if you couldn't tell. And the new orchestrations are really just fascinatingly beautiful in a a smaller orchestra, but yet still rather large for today's Broadway. Now, is this show for tourists or or purists? I think it is for both. I think anyone could see this show. I think if you are a Sondheim purist, you will discover new things about company that you haven't thought about. If you're a tourist and want to see a classic Broadway musical reimagined, this is for you. And that's company. Anyway, we're back with Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Evan, and we're joined by 90s teen idol and all-round heartthrob, Duncan Sheik. Goodness gracious me, finally on my show. It's for listeners at home, this has been over a year in the making to have Duncan on the show, so it's very exciting for us now. Who were on the posters on your wall as a teenager? So who were your teen idols? I guess we'd have to ask in which era, but I'm going to start in the more fashionable era and say, you know, Roxy Music was a big one, both because it was a cool band and there were hot chicks, you know, sort of of covered the bases. (laughs) (laughs) See, my Spice Girls thing, it was these were a band and they're pretty ladies. Like, Uh, no one would ever tell that I'm gay. Anyway. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So I will say that I had one brush with the Spice Girls as well, where I played this massive concert in Mexico, this huge, like televised concert. I mean, it was all like mime. So you were just literally miming, but it went out to like hundreds of millions of Spanish speaking people all over the world. And this would have been 19... late 97. So it's when Spice Girls first came out as well. And shortly after that, I got my first Grammy nomination, which I did not win. But in an article, like in People Magazine, they were like, well, who's your dream date for the Grammys? I was like, yeah, you know, Victoria, whoever she was before. (laughs) Adams, Victoria Adams. Yeah. And then I got in the mail, like, you know, a picture of her saying like, oh, Duncan, you're my dream date for the Grammys as well. (laughs) Oh my God, where is this, Duncan? And can you please leave it to me in your will? (laughs) Posh, yeah, posh. Oh my God, I am so jealous. She snagged herself Beckham. Yeah, she did. (laughs) Anyway, so I think she did good in terms of how the direction that she went in the end. Yes. But here we are. So that's my one, Spice Girls. Sorry, I haven't thought about this in like 20 years. but No, that's wonderful. 
Wow. We've heard some pretty cool stories, but that's... But also the sad part of that story is that it was in People magazine. It was before the Grammys happened. And, you know, I was like this sort of nobody up and comer who was in this category with Elton John and Seal and Maxwell and myself as like best pop mill vocal 1997. <laughs> and the person, I had a friend who worked at People Magazine, and he was asking me about how I felt about my fellow nominees in my category. And I didn't know that this was an on the record conversation, stupidly. You know, I could probably, I had had too much to drink and I was at Sundance Film Festival. And I was like, well, yeah, I like, I like Seal a lot. Like I'm a huge fan. I think he's, I, his first two records are extraordinary. I think Maxwell has an incredible voice, really psyched to be in the same category with him. But Elton John like hasn't written a decent song since 1974. And they printed that in People yeah. Magazine. Ouch. And I got in so much trouble. For, I'm, I mean, understandably. And I, you know, Elton John is a total sweetheart. And I, to this day, I feel fucking terrible about it. Yeah. But I, you know, just goes to show you, it's sometimes it's better to keep your cards close to the chest. Yes. Doing this show is a tightrope, I tell you that, because we need to be honest about our feelings and we are a comedy show, but we're not here to insult people. That's why we do things so silly and over the top because we put that work in, you know, to show people. We're taking this very seriously. We have so much respect for the music, but of all the people to say that about Alton John, who is very vocal to anyone who badmouths him. So that's ballsy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think he said anything publicly to me i know that through the grapevine his people got in touch with atlantic records and they were like can you tell this kid to shut the fuck up like who does he think he is rightfully so you know so anyway that was (laughs) goodness hey of course he won the grammy that year so yeah that was for um candle in the wind i believe it was you're right you're correct and so anyway So I'm really digressing. The other posters I would have had on my wall at various times, you know, Tears for Fears, Songs from the Big Chair. I think like what other like posters, posters, posters. Oh, Japan. So I'm a huge David Sylvian fan. So I don't know if you know the band Japan that well. They're kind of like the really arty, sort of in an alternate universe of, you know, they're like the arty Duran Duran but like 50 times musically more interesting and compelling. And David Sylvian's a pretty amazing artist. Uh, and then like Talk, 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 like the late Talk, Talk records, uh, Color of Spring, uh, Spirit of Being, Laughingstock. Those would be, you know, sort of the posters that I might have had. Awesome. We'll move on to the musical because this week Evan went down an actual rabbit hole with Duncan's musical Alice by Heart, which is a musical take on Alice in Wonderland. Now, before we get into it, I've just got a couple of thoughts because I did a production of Alice in Wonderland 20 something years ago, nearly 25 years ago. And I've seen another production of it. And I think it's in its original form, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Alice in Wonderland don't work on stage. And that's why when I first heard this, not only is the music absolutely amazing and has that same vibe of, of your branding, basically, your, your style is, is there. It, it's, it's all over this show, but it's done in such an interesting way. It's not just a character going from world to world or scene to scene like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Alice in Wonderland are, which is why they don't work on stage. Mm. If you're going to do them on stage, you have to do something with them or make them really, really, really stupid and over the top silly. Yeah. Because then your audience is going to have fun. But those two shows, I don't know why, maybe Peter Pan as well, but you've got the flying and the sword fighting. So there is actual fun stuff in Peter Pan that gets people going. Yeah. But I don't know. The other two just don't seem to work. But anyways. So I I definitely have a, a theory about that. I think, you know, if you look at the original text of Alice in Wonderland and to some degree, the, the text of the Royal Doll, but really almost more the movie, like they're, they're, those things are incredibly episodic 
And there's just sort of like a thing happens and then a thing happens and then a thing happens and a thing happens and then it's over, so to speak. You know, as a, in terms of like having a narrative arc, they're thin on the ground, both of those stories. I mean, again, in the Royal Doll, I think it, there's more of it there than let's say in either of the movies, but it's, it's strong suit is the characters and the set pieces. Yes. And that's why people love it. But, you know, when you're trying to create, you know, some piece of entertainment slash art or slash theater that people are going to sit there for two plus hours and, and follow a story, it's rough going. And, you know, working with Stephen Sater on Spring Awakening, that's sort of the genius move that Stephen Sater did was he was able to take the episodic the original text of the Vedic and of Spring Awakening is also very episodic and very just, it's just like a thing happens after another and it's, it's racy and it's anti-bourgeois and it's irreverent and a scathing rebuke of German society at the time. But it's not like that satisfying narrative. And Stephen was able to sort of construct something within this material to make it work on stage in a better way. And I think, you know, that was also, you know, certainly the goal with Alice by Heart was to sort of take the source material and then graft a a bigger narrative on top of that source material and yeah. make it work as a satisfying unrequited love story between the, the white rabbit and Alice. And, you know, to the extent that that works or not, that's <laughs> up to the audience, but certainly that was the, the hope. So whether or not that works, we'll find out. Because <laughs> Evan dived into that. He's got thoughts. <laughs> yes. So we'll see. What did you think? Please tell the composer to his face. But he does have Tony's Grammys, all the awards and accolades. So and honestly, I, I I have very very thick skin, so don't pull any punches. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I chucked on Alice by Heart and uh, immediately sort of went, oh, this has got a, a Spring Awakening vibe to it, and and then clicked. Oh, of course, of course it does. It's the same guys. <laughs> it's the same guys. Yeah, yeah. It's like the right wing always say, "Let's go branding." Yeah. <laughs> Took a second. I thought we were not going to politics. Sorry. Sorry, I just had to. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a dollar in the jar later. Anyways, Evan. But yeah, and then clicked. Oh, I, I get to talk to the person who wrote my favorite song out of all the musicals I've had to listen to. Oh, wow. The Bitch of Living. Yeah. From Spring Awakening is my absolute favorite song. I will just chuck that on randomly. You know, that's, I think it's the only musical I will just put on just to listen to. You know, oh, wow. Purely. Purely just for my own pleasure. I'll wear that as a badge of honor for sure. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank, well, so yeah thank you. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Bitch of Living is just such a hell of a song. It's just brilliant. But yes, we're listening this week to Alice by Heart. And yeah, again, the, I, I did get a Spring Awakening vibe, but it, I love Spring Awakening. So awesome. Yeah. That's just branding. That's all it is. Yeah. There's so many puns in here in, in, this, in this album that there was tortoise and purpose and um yeah. what was that the sh- your shell of grief I yes the shell of grief. Song. Yeah. um manage your flamingo made me laugh a lot obviously down the hole is a hell of a song and then listening to it again on your um cafe carlisle album oh that was i think um, what we did that song that night was afternoon which is the lyric is down the hole in the song right. but the actual song down the hole is the first song in the record and then that song is called afternoon oh yeah. it's still down the hole is a, is a hell of a song yeah no i agree that's the best that's the best song on the record yeah so. and actually actually going back to the cafe album um for you Mm. that's a wedding song i i could hear that <laughs> being played at a wedding quite easily and if I'm, i hadn't been aware of it i probably would have chosen that i'm fairly <laughs> certain a lot of people have gotten married and been conceived to duncan's music <laughs> yeah. over the past 20 something years Evan. a lot of babies <laughs> and then quite bitter divorces and you know all kinds of things afterwards but <laughs> <laughs> a whole other podcast <laughs> but yeah uh, yeah uh, I, I i listened to this i listened to a, a good chunk of your back catalog as well and you've, you've got yeah. this sort of unique 
way of approaching songwriting where like I can now listen to songs you've written and go, oh yeah, that's a Duncan Sheik. It's branding. (laughs) There's a personality in there. There's a branding. I I love this. I I wish that there was a bitch of living in there somewhere. I was waiting for a bitch of living. Yeah, Yeah, fair Um, enough. And and there's there's some there's some songs in there that come close as well. But yeah, I love down the hole. I love the flamingo song. I love the turtle song. Yeah, Shrunk Enough was a really nice song as well. Um, Yeah, I just love the way you put songs together. It flows and it makes sense. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can hear the rhymes coming, but but you know, often you don't. I love it. It was like, yeah, because I love Spring Awakening so much. This, it, the, what are we? It's obviously based on Alice in Wonderland. And of course, I'm familiar with that story. And I love how it does tell the story in the songs. You know, so many musicals will just sing for four and a half minutes and, and nothing changes. You know, you're actually moving the narrative in each song. Love that. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. There's some just wonderful singing. There's some wonderful arrangements. Lyrics that made me laugh. Uh, lyrics that make you sad. It's it's yep. it's kind of it's a roller coaster ride. This one, I'd love to see it on stage. And not depressing. No, no you're not killing any children in this one. So we're not walking no. away going, <laughs> oh my god, I'm so depressed. I'm trying to remember <laughs> which, which show did I kill children? Well, they were teenagers <laughs> technically in in Spring Awakening. Okay. <laughs> But I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years. They're children to me by now. So, okay. but as I say, I haven't yeah. seen Spring Awakening, so I don't know any of that. I have no idea what happens in that show. I have a, three, a three-year-old daughter. So like, that's what I think of as, as children. Yeah. And so you know, when I think of Spring Awakening, especially because I was just with these guys, they're all like 35 now. So I, I just don't think of them as children anymore. Yeah. But they're all my age and I still think of them as children as well because obviously Leah was on Glee. Yeah. And even though she was like 30 while she was on Glee, they were still playing teenagers. So She was 14 when she was in the first workshop of Spring Awakening in New York. Oh, wow. She was 14 years old, yeah. So I've known her for a long time. Goodness me. Anyway, Seven. But yeah, no, I I thoroughly enjoyed this week getting to listen to to Alice Cooper again um, after probably for the freaking thousandth time and yeah listening to a musical by a composer i I know i'm gonna like it's good fun this week yeah thoroughly enjoyed it it's it's every song has its own little charm and like i said just some some fantastic singing it's catchy it's clever there's puns it's funny there's there's so much in there the ballads are nice as well because there's that vibe to it there's that there, there, there is that like we've talked about again branding that that melancholy feel to your music that is there and i think that's where the the appeal comes in as opposed to some like even someone like sondheim i can't listen to a lot of his ballads because even if they're really good i'm still just on board just hurry up please yeah. like get on with it um but yeah so there there is that i don't know that sort of darkness that tinge of darkness in it that that i really do like but what does chilling the regrets mean i'm gonna just say up front that i'm speaking as the spokesperson for the lyricist yes. and book writer of this show who is Stephen Sater. And so, you know, I had to sort of mea culpa my way into this, you know, chilling the regrets really refers to this idea of letting go of all of your hangups and letting go of all of the stuff that you feel sort of guilt and shame about because none of it was your fault. Yeah. None of it was really caused by your doing. It was just caused by life happening. And when you sort of recognize that and you sort of quote unquote chill the regrets, you know, you're able to, in the case of this instance, you know, take some mushrooms or smoke some pot or whatever. I'm not really a pothead, but, but you're able to do that and just enjoy the experience and not be weighed down by stuff that happens in your past. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, that's the sort of the essence of that idea. Awesome. And while you're on a roll, what does Brillig Brillig mean? Because I actually really oh. like that song. I think it's dark and yeah. gloomy. And the chapel walking yeah. coming out. Cool. With yeah. So again, I think that they're, you know, both um, Lewis Carroll and Stephen Sater like to sort of just play with kind of onomatopoetic verbiage and, and language and, and mess with it. And I think it's sort of the idea 
that like when you go into a doctor's office and they're like telling you what's wrong with you and they're using language that's so abstruse or i suppose if you go to like a, an ivy league university and you study semiotics like i do and people talk at you and it's yeah. just so unrelated to normal english you know <laughs> and so it just becomes like a string of multi-syllabic sort of nonsense that you're supposed to supposedly understand but you have no idea what they're talking about so that's i think that's what really braille refers to yeah that also describes this podcast <laughs> no one ever has any idea what we are talking about <laughs> but yeah I, I really looking forward to this coming to australia or just being done here and i hope to direct it myself because i i do love that idea of it's a bomb shelter i believe that they're in yes so the conceit i mean just to spell it out so so it's clear because you guys weren't able to see the show there's really yeah. only been one off broadway production of the show at mcc in 2019 it was yeah. a very cool production cooperman brothers to the choreography, which was extraordinarily great. And Jesse Nelson, really fantastic director, directed the show. I, I think that there's work to be done on it because I think yeah. audiences were kind of scratching their head in terms of following what the narrative really was doing. But yeah. the, the conceit is that you have a, a young girl who's in the bomb shelter in World War II England in the London underground with a whole group of people. And, you know, she's somebody who's a fan of the Lewis Carroll book and one of her friends and her sort of, her love interest, but the I'm sort of unconsummated love interest mm -hmm. who they would read this book together. He's down there and he's dying of consumption. Oh, okay. He, he's sort of running out of time. So he's the white rabbit. And all the, these people who are stuck in the underground sort of transfigure into the various characters in the Lewis Carroll story, yeah. you know, as this, as this progresses. And you sort of see her try to keep the white rabbit character alive, though I think they all know that he's not going to make it. So it's this sort of like a, a tragedy of like a young love that never comes to fruition because of the circumstances of, you know, of this kid getting sick and dying in the underground if i say it like that it sounds like a real bummer <laughs> but i'm no saying it like that i'm not surprised that a child dies in this musical <laughs> yeah sorry so <laughs> sorry anyway um but but i you know i think along the way <laughs> along the way you know there there are these um experiences that they have and and things that they come to understand in this process that are, you know, profound and, and hopefully really moving. But again, you know, Stephen and Jesse are very, very sophisticated writers and thinkers. The stuff that they have in their back pocket is all, you know, Ibsen and Chekhov and Shakespeare. And it's like pretty, you know, T.S. Eliot and I don't know, it's just pretty intense stuff so it's not you know it's nothing is really spelled out in a way that maybe some contemporary audiences might want so i i understand that it's a it's a you know there may be some work that we need to do to make it a little more accessible as we move forward and i think like you know musically you know because it's like world war ii england yeah. I, I was sort of trying to you know play with some of these bands that sort of came out of World War II England. So, I mean, there's obviously, there's like the Beatles and Stones, but it's more like the kinks in a way, like things that had this sort of real storytelling quality to the songwriting and to the, and to the recordings themselves. So that those became sort of touchstones for me in that score. And, and to the point of there, there not being a bitch of living, you know, I, it wasn't so much about electric guitars in the show, it was more about sort of uh, some elect electronic programming as a, a hybrid with, with sort of organic orchestration and kind of playing with that, the colors of those two things. So it's fair enough, there's not a bitch of living, but who knows, it might, there may be more electric guitars before we're all done. Well, th if anything, I, I'm kind of glad there isn't a, a bitch of living in there because then I would have been going, oh, are you trying to, you know, cash in on my favorite song again? Yeah, you're just, you know, you're just doing the same thing. When I read reviews of, of different shows that, uh, that I work on, 
like or just noir, for example, we actually got some quite good reviews, but there was one sort of a frustrating review. And the guy was like, well, this doesn't sound anything like Spring Awakening. And I'm like, well, why would I write this? Why would it sound like anything like Spring Awakening? <laughs> like, am I supposed to just write the same show over and over again? I don't know. It's a funny thing. Look, so, I mean, I only got that vibe just really just from the way the songs are put together, the, the way it's written, not what's written. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a branding there. Like when... An Andrew Lloyd Webber musical starts up, you can typically tell it's an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical because even if there's that classical vibe to it, he's got those electric guitars behind it. So you, yeah, you, that branding is there immediately. Sondheim, you can tell his music straight away. Yeah. Your music, Duncan, you can tell straight away. That is why they're the masters and why they're in the positions they are in. So for up-and-coming composers out there that and writers, that's what you need to do. Find your flavour and find your branding and flesh it out. Don't do the same thing over and over again, but use that as your rue in the jambalaya or whatever it is, that the base that keeps the rest of it all together. So that's really what, that's, that's why you've had the success you've had because you know what you're doing. Well, no, I'm, I, I mean, I totally agree that it's sort of about finding your own individual voice that is yeah. as much as possible unique to you and not, you know, copying Sondheim or Jason Robert Brown or whoever it is that, you know, yeah. you're, you know, or Gershwin, ah, you know, it doesn't matter. Like find your own voice and then, yes, play with that and spin that out and spin that web out into as many places as it can go um yeah that is i think important for any artist to to mm. discover you know how to sort of widen the aperture but know that you're you know in that you're taking a picture of something that you really understand yeah you know this is what actually surprised me again listening to the i started from your first album and just yeah. started listening through and you know right out of the blocks in your early 20s you, you're writing songs like i said the way they're kind of structured you, is the same today but it was it was funny listening to your voice change over the years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then and then jumping to the to the latest ones. Yeah, that was really yeah. cool. It was like the same way, written the same way. But it, it, that was the other thing. Every song on the album, uh, certainly if your first album, like they're all equally good. Like there's no, I couldn't hear any you know low points. If you know what I mean. Uh, oh my god, Evan, you kiss us. How embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Oh, we'll move on because I think we've run our course on Alice. Unless there's anything else we want to throw in. No, I was just going to say I'm I'm, I'm glad there's no bitch of living, and and I don't think totally fucked would have worked in there either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a different it's a, it's a different vernacular. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's it. Kind of yeah. glad it wasn't in there. Uh, anyways, it looks like Allison wandered off to an ad break. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Hey listeners, Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time? Go to www.thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. After barely three hours of light sleep, Toniston Turnbull slowly opens his eyes, his body feeling heavier than it ever has before. Not from extra weight, from tiredness and stress. Polly sighs in the shadows behind him, the flame of the nearest barbed wire tiki torch tower having died down, but not out, while Toniston napped. Are you awake? Toniston whispers. Oh, how can I sleep in this place? Polly moans, turning onto her side and facing Toniston, who stays on his back, imagining obscure animal-esque shapes in the rusted tin roof above them, shadows faintly formed by the nearest dying torches. We need to work out a way to get out of here, Toniston states the obvious. 
He whispers despite the fact the nearest shacks to their own are several metres away and the occupants presumably asleep as most prisoners seem to be. How? There's no fence to squeeze through or even climb, Polly replies, sitting up in bed and then stretching out her sore arms. The hairs stand on end from the slight chill in the air. I don't know, but I think the whole fighting thing is a distraction. You mean to distract the other prisoners when new ones arrive? No, I I think that was just bad timing. Didn't you notice? Toniston goes on to explain his theory. That fight happened. Everybody gathered around. I didn't see one person who wasn't watching. And then when I vomited, the only gate in this place closed shut. What are you trying to say? I think something happened when everyone's back was turned. Like what? Whispers Polly, her voice breaking up in fear. I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. Toniston's brain starts working overtime. But it's strange that nobody seems to want to leave. They seem almost happy. Definitely content. So, when's the next one of those stupid beatdowns? Toniston can't help but think Polly looks tough, almost evil in the shadows as she asks, I don't know, Toniston begins. But both teenagers are distracted by a crumbling noise in the distance. Hopping out of bed, Toniston joins Polly on her own, equally uncomfortable one. Spotting a large, white package hovering close to the cave ceiling, behind it, a shadowy figure. The package is lowered down, causing the teenagers themselves to lower as well, hoping not to be spotted by whom, or what, may be operating this obscure crane. Over a long, slow descent, the package is dropped to the ground. Polly keeps her eyes on it, but Toniston looks up immediately, spotting a large black shadow scurry away to God only knows where. Come, he whispers, as he quietly hops off her bed, slipping into his docks with bare feet. Polly follows his lead. Careful to keep watch on all directions, the teenagers swiftly sneak over to the white package, their hearts beating an almost tribal jam in perfect harmony, and stopping in their tracks as the sudden realisation of what lies before them sinks in. A woman, seemingly in her early twenties, wrapped up in bandages from the neck down. No, not bandages. Is that spider web? Polly asks, completely mortified at the prospect. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! Anyway, so back with Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Evan, and we are joined by 90s teen heartthrob Duncan Sheik. Goodness gracious me. Now, how does one become a 90s teen heartthrob? I'm asking for a friend who's a baker and not at all Evan. <laughs> uh, well, how do you become? Well, I, yeah, I think you'd need a time machine for one. Uh, how do you become a teen heartthrob overall? I don't know. I think it's just, it's about being in your late teens and early twenties and uh, being really thoughtful and sensitive and projecting some idea of having higher aspirations and romantic ideals that are unsullied by the base hormones of your of your biology i think that's that's sort of the key but now i'm 52 now so you know that's it's not really an aspiration of mine anymore. so i haven't thought about it that much well it looks like evan doesn't stand a chance uh, but anyways, <laughs> of course he does no with uh spring awakening that hot young cast has gone on to such bigger things so how do you define star quality? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I don't think that I'm particularly good at picking it out. And I would say that, you know, the the people that I've been lucky enough to work with have a really good gauge of those things. And so, you know, folks where I, in, in an audition room, I didn't necessarily see what was there that you know went on in some of these shows to just do extraordinary things and and it was like oh you had that in you i didn't really realize that and so you know i i would say that there are people who have that with their skill set is like recognizing star quality and you know uh, to be honest my taste is probably more eccentric 
and maybe not as mainstream, you know, as, as some other folks. So the things that I respond to are not necessarily going to be starry in that sort of big marquee name kind of way. But, you know, I like to think that some of the people that I was, you know, that, that I was uh, part of casting, you know, had these really, have had really cool, interesting, unique careers subsequent to Spring Awakening. So, you know, you'd say John Gallagher Jr., for example, as just picking one out of a hat. Yeah, quite a, a good film career. He was in yeah. Cloverfield Lane. Mulholland Drive. No, Cloverfield Lane, the one where the girl wakes up and she's in Bunker with John Goodman. Oh, that's the sequel to... Well, it's a spiritual sequel to Cloverfield, yes. it's That's the one. Yeah, no, I, I'm aware of it. I haven't seen it. Oh, it. it's really good. And and yeah, he's in that. Or somebody like Lauren Pritchard. Well, I'll just say because also Lauren was, you know, sort of his partner in crime in the show. And, you know, and she's gone on to have a really cool recording career and songwriting career herself. I like to think I was at least somewhat aware of the really deep talent that those folks had. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting question after that Alton John story. How necessary or important has diplomacy been during your career? (laughs) It's a a great question. And I obviously, you know, I was not very diplomatic in my early days. And that was sort of more out of naivete and just not really knowing how to manage those situations. Then, you know, sort of after I had some success as a solo artist and I got into the world of musical theater, I was, I was really badly behaved in a different way, which was more sort of out of hubris. And, you know, I, like, like, you know, I'm the composer, like I'm the songwriter. I know how it's supposed to sound and everyone else is an idiot and just please shut up and let me just make it sound how it's supposed to sound, you know? And I had to, you know, I had to learn the hard way that that's, not a very collaborative approach to <laughs> making any kind of art. Um, and, and so, you know, that, you know, that was just a, again, it was a lesson I had to learn. And I like to think I'm, I'm better about it now, but I think I still have it in my DNA that it's like, I've got a sort of a laser focus about how I want something to sound and how it's supposed to be sung and how the orchestration is supposed to sound and, and, down to the sound design of it you know i'm very i'm sort of a gear head so i'm I'm a sound designer's worst nightmare when i'm working on a piece of musical theater so um yeah so that's just that's just you know that's sort of how i'm built and um uh, I, you know, I try to manage it. I try to manage my flamingo as best I can, but it's yep. tough. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of uh, touches on a, a, a question I had was, if, again, listening through your back catalogue, was how does someone who's a you know, solo recording artist jump to musical theatre? Like how that came about? Well, so in my case, I had done a lot of musical theatre as a very young kid in South Carolina. You know, I... I I had a, a, a string of four musicals between third and sixth grade. So let's say between when I was eight and 12. So I did Annie. I did the Muppet show in which I played Gonzo. I did Barnum. <laughs> and then I, I was the Artful Dodger and Oliver. That was my swan song in terms of like as a, as a musical theater actor. <laughs> and then uh, I sort of, you know, got into just, you know, making recordings and I got a four track recorder and I was just sort of doing, you know, was in various bands, uh, sort of half-heartedly in bands through high school and stuff. And then when I went out to LA, after I graduated from university, I got signed to Atlantic, made a couple records. And after my second record came out, it was that, you know, you t- you mentioned the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And it was like sort of that moment when, certainly in America, things that were like alternative rock and uh, sort of alternative singer songwriter music that was quite popular on the radio in the mid nineties and the late nineties, it just sort of like fell away and it just sort of became this very heavily produced sort of pop music. And I didn't feel a lot of kinship with that stuff. So I sort of stiff armed whatever you want to call it, the sort of commercial music business. And I, I made like, uh, my third record was out, it came out on Nonesuch called Phantom Moon. 
And it was just a completely acoustic record with like woodwind orchestrations. You know, it was the most not, it was the most anti-commercial thing I could have possibly done. Yeah. And, and it was a collaboration with Steven Sater. And then he gave me a copy of the original, uh, well, a translation of Spring Awakening, the Ted Hughes translation of the of Spring Awakening. He said, read this play and let me know what you think. And, you know, let's write a musical. And I was like, oh, Stephen, like, I hate musicals. Like, like it's like the last thing I want to do. <laughs> you know, like, I want nothing to do with musicals. And he's like, no, 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 just read the play and, and think about it. And I, I loved to play. Like, I thought it was really cool and, and racy and, and transgressive. And, and, and then, you know, sort of, so my first thought was like, well, or maybe my second or third thought <laughs> was if the music can be like something that's stylistically relevant to what I like, you know, if, if you don't mind the fact that it's going to sound like some weird combination of Bjork and Radiohead and Jeff Buckley, then fine, let's do it. But otherwise, I don't think I'm your guy. You know, and so that's how it began. And I, and I should mention that Stephen and I met because we're both practicing Buddhists. And I, I've been practicing Buddhism for almost 33 years. And so I think, you know, but our Buddhist practice and sort of outlook very much informed how we looked at this story and what we wanted to accomplish in making Spring Awakening a piece of art that might reach a broad audience of young people. Yeah. Speaking of Stephen Sater, in what ways do you and Stephen complement each other? And in mm. what ways have you clashed creatively? Like juicy mm. scandal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Stephen and I have actually had a relatively friction-free creative, you know, sort of relationship over the past 22 years. And we've at this point, we've written actually five musicals together and like countless sort of one-off songs. And again, Phantom Moon, my third record he wrote the lyrics for. So, you know, we've written hundreds of songs. You know, I, we have moments where we might disagree about little things, but it's, but in a way, because we are such different people, that sort of works out in terms of the relationship. Because I really sort of respect his territory and his facility with language and his sort of specific approach to how he writes lyrics and, and how he uses language. That's a very particular to Stephen. And I love what he does. You know, he's a completely unique artist in that way. And that, and I really value that. So, and I think, you know, similarly, Stephen sort of values how I approach production and how I sort of take his words and, and graft them onto a piece of music, the sort of hopefully the uniqueness of that. You know, I think we, we kind of have our the sort of like non-overlapping magisterium, <laughs> you know, where in, in, in terms of like what each of our role is in the creation of these things, we're very respectful of that. So it works yeah. out pretty well. You're lucky. I always say that I cannot stand anybody who is like me. That's why I like people that are so different because anyone like me, I'm like, no, I just do not have time. I'm annoying enough as it is. Yeah. <laughs> one Aaron is enough. Yeah, one is enough. Oh, yeah. Anyways, what is your personal industry pet peeve? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. You know, again, maybe it's because of my Buddhist practice or whatever. My approach to the vicissitudes and the annoyances of things that crop up in the process of making theater or making records. It's just like, that's just a thing that's happening. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way the culture is going or it's the, it's, or, you know, if it's a specific person, it's like, ah, oh, yeah. that's their conditioning in their genes. It's not their fault that they're like that, that they're their most annoying person in humanity. It's not their fault. You know, so it's just, you know, it's just, that's how they were built. And, you know, so whether it's a situation or circumstance or people, for the most part, I'm just like, well, there's nothing I can do about it either. It's just, I have to just like, deal with this stupidity for a minute and then it will be gone in five minutes and I won't even think about it anymore you know and then you go on and do the next thing that you have to do so yeah I mean that's that's a very vague answer to your specific yeah. question yep pretty much <laughs> <laughs> you you want you want you want some juicy tidbits, but I am afraid yeah. 
Well, no, I, I want whatever gets you ranting. And we've had lots of different answers. So. Oh, I mean, the thing that I rant about, it's funny. It's like the thing that I rant about, and we touched on it a little bit before, and it's not the focus of this podcast, but I, I rant about people who, as, if this happens in America, I suppose it happens in Australia too, but like, you know, like people like Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro or this sort of like weird oh, young these sort of wacky, crazy people that have sort of infected the culture. And I like, I rant about their ranting. <laughs> like yeah. their ranting yeah. is so absurd. that yeah. it just, I just sort of like, who, what, what's going on right now? But if I have a little pet peeve, like that's where it's right. Back. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm aware of all of those. I've, I've watched Ben Shapiro and people like that. And then every time it's, it's like, is that all you've got? You've, you've just whinging about the other side. That's all you do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. It's people have very small minded views of the real problems in society. And they're, and you know, they don't even, they're not looking at all at the actual real problems in society. So that's, that's my pet peeve, but it's very broad. Yeah. Okay. So we have a theory on this show. Do you think that we as humans may one day or may have already run out of new music genres? Because when was the last time we had a new genre that came out that wasn't just a slightly tweaked version of one before it? Sure. I'll give you my two-minute dissertation on that. Yeah. Um, hi, hi, Goose. Okay, she's just coming to <laughs> join me again. So, you know, I think if, if you look at the... If you, if you look at the history of, I mean, I, I could sort of go back. It, it's a, I, I worked on a show with, with Steven Sater actually about Nero. So part of the thing was like, you know, what, what, what did music sound like in the Roman Empire back in 64? You know, like actually 64. There's not really a lot of notation. You know, we sort of have some sense that, you know, there were harps and there were drums and maybe there were some sort of crude horn instruments. And to whatever extent that they used harmony, it's very unclear. Pythagoras understood these ideas about sort of note relationships, but it's not, there's not a lot of notation. You don't really have much notation until, you know, let's say the turn of the millennium you know, when you start to have these sort of Gregorian chants and you have liturgical music, right? And liturgical music is is what it is. And and as you progress through the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, uh, you see it start to evolve harmonically in a, in a really interesting way. You sort of obviously get to Bach and you, and you see things that were maybe sort of only like duophonic, things become quite polyphonic and sort of that Western use of harmony gets quite robust. And in, in a funny way, just in terms of like sort of diatonic or even chromatic harmony, after the 15th or 16th century, we didn't really do anything that new. I mean, it's just using those 12 notes in whichever combination. Okay. Yeah. Of course, stylistically things changed. We went through these periods, you know, we went, from a classical period into the romantic period. And obviously I'm, I'm mostly talking about Western music here, but there were these folk traditions that fed into it. So obviously, you know, when you get to America and these sort of like, whatever you want to call it, blues traditions or like country music traditions, it's all, it's all coming from sort of at the African diaspora and, and what that music from that continent sort of brought, you know, banjo, people think of banjos as like, oh, it's like country music. That banjo comes from Africa. <laughs> so I think you see, okay, fine. So let's say we've come into the 20th century and you have, you know, like so say the birth of jazz, you know, and then you have the birth of blues and, and country and Western music. And then in the fifties, you have the birth of rock and roll. And you could say like rock and roll sort of lasted for, you know, you might say six, you might say rock and roll is done. I mean, you know, in a way there's about four rock bands left on the planet. You know, there's Foo Fighters, Kings <laughs> of Leon, I don't know, a couple other ones, but there's not much. It's sort of like it's, and then maybe you could say in, in the eighties, you had the birth of hip hop. And also I, I will say in the eighties, you had the birth of electronic music and let's say house, house and techno. So you had this sort of birth of these these genres at that time, which have obviously become juggernauts in their own way subsequently. 
So I think, you know, lately we see these periods of 50 or 60 or, or 30 year chunks of time where a certain genre has a lot of influence on the culture. And I'm sort of personally like curious what the next genre might be. You know, I mean, I, I can't predict it, but I'm quite looking forward to there being another interesting genre. In the early 70s, people wouldn't necessarily have been able to predict hip hop or even electronic dance music for that matter. That, that would have been sort of a, not an idea in their head. So what's that next idea gonna be? I, I don't know, but I'm fascinated. Um, and I think there will be. So again, yeah. very long, long-winded long answer to that question. No, it's not. I think the, the most newest genre would have to be whiny millennial. <laughs> anyway. Well, I think it was, there's, you know, there's a lot of sub-genres, obviously. And, but millennials are always whiny. And I was once a very whiny, you know, 17, 18, 19-year-old. So I, I have to commit, you know, I can't, well, I can't criticize it as well. <laughs> yeah. I was, I mean, in my own way, I was, the, you know, I was the king of wuss rock. I fully admit it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but we won't deny that on this heavy metal show. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what has been your um, experience with standing ovations? We had an opening night at Noir, as I told you last week in Houston. And it's, it's not uncommon to get a standing ovation at an opening night for a theater piece because a lot of the people there are sort of rooting for the show to go well. But that one felt particularly lovely and effusive and authentic. I like to think so. So that that was really nice. And, you know, in my certainly in my time with Spring Awakening, there there have been a lot of standing ovations and I've been you know, in a way, I'm almost sort of jaded about it. Or what's worse is like, if they don't happen, then I'm just like, what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the concern. So, like with audiences are just dishing it out to everything now. And actors are walking away thinking that it's, they were owed that. Yeah. And if they don't get it, it's a matter of what did we do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, mate. You just got the right audience that night that knows what they're doing. That's all you got. The point that you just made that I, I've heard before is like you can tell when it's a real standing ovation and they're just standing yeah. because everyone else is. There's a different yeah. sound, a different energy to the crowd and you go, yeah, we deserve that. Yeah, right. Well, it's also like we call, you know, people who, who do an encore <laughs> It's not, nobody really wants it. It's like, we call it a non-core, you know? So like, we're going to do the non-core now. Yeah. It's like, people just want to go home. And yet here you are playing another fucking song. And again, I, in Australia, there may be a different sort of cultural attitude towards standing ovations. Like it happens more in America than in the UK. Yeah. Well, it, it didn't used to be common, but now it feels like reality TV influences sort of seeped in that you know someone on an australian idol american idol could do a really bad performance but they still get a standing ovation from everyone yeah. the judges and i think yeah. that's it's sort of sending the wrong message i think because yeah, yeah. well well the impression i get yeah. from you aaron is that in australian theater that they kind of stand for every show well nowadays Pretty i much. think they are I, I was the opening night but i think now it's sort of changed a little bit which I think it's it's an actual thing. It's not just, that's not the standard, you know? It's applause is the standard. Yeah. When you stand up, that's meant to be because you've had a dream girls moment that has blown you away that you cannot help but stand up. And I think that meaning has gone. And that's kind of, that's sad because it's that yeah. was something you walked away going, oh my God, we got a standing ovation tonight. And it was meant because it didn't happen all the time. Yeah. No, I think I think that it's it's good to understand that it's meant for something that's extraordinary and by and and so by definition, it's not something that happens every day. You know? No. So um, so that that's a good I think that's a good way of looking at it and probably a more 
uh, a more sane way of <laughs> approaching these things. I've been guilty of just standing up because I'm supposed to stand up because I don't want to be a, a curmudgeon who's just sitting there while everybody else <laughs> is standing oh, up. <laughs> I'm completely fine being a curmudgeon, seriously. I, I feel better being a curmudgeon right, than right. I, I do feeling dirty standing up when I don't want to stand <laughs> up. But anyways, lastly, why is a raven like a writing desk? Yeah, well, there's <laughs> there's famously not an answer to that riddle. <laughs> so if I would give some glib, uh, uh, some glib response to why is a raven like a writing? No, this is actually not glib. I, I would say that, you know, anything that exists, an object that exists within consciousness is simply that. It's like just an the, ephemeral dream-like thing that exists within consciousness and it has no actual uh, lasting reality in and of itself. So a raven is like a writing desk, is like anything else in your in the perception of Maya. It's just a thing that it's like a cloud crossing across the sky. I have no idea what any of that means but i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> i think you were saying that they're both things like <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're both objects of consciousness and in fact have no real lasting reality so that's better than my answer which is that they both make good fire kindling <laughs> Which usually gets me uninvited from every party and everything ever. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't know birds made good kindling, but I'm. I'm up well, I. The, I know, didn't. They... Don't know if they do. Let's just not ever <laughs> test that theory out ever. But anyways, it has been <laughs> so wonderful having you on the show. Really, where can people find you on the social medias? Yeah, I mean, I have an Instagram account. I have a Twitter account. You know, I d I'm not like a, I, I, I sort of use them as maybe sort of a promotional tool. I'll, I'm the first to admit I'm not like the yep. most engaged with it as I might be. You're not posting Wordle every day, basically. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, and I, I've learned, I, I've, I've actually, I've gotten myself in trouble when I did engage with it that way. So I sort of learned my lesson. But um, I have a new record coming out next month which is called claptrap and the first two singles are on spotify now as well you know as well as anywhere else you choose to find them and the the next single comes out on the 17th and we're excited about the new record it's been nice to just make a record and not be working on so much theater stuff for, because of the pandemic that was a really that was sort of like a, a silver lining to the whole thing yeah so um yeah i'm excited to maybe go out and play some shows and like I said, I'm going to be in Australia in October, and I'm not sure if I, if I'll be playing shows or not. But you know, probably I'll be around and doing some press stuff, and, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yep, in Perth, the ass end of the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll actually, I'm going to be in I'm going to be in Adelaide for a, for a wedding, and then Perth. So, and you know, I'm hopefully I'll make it. To to Sydney and Melbourne, but yep. you know, I, I leave it to me to just go to Australia and just go to Adelaide and Perth. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Usually they're the ones that people don't go to. Yeah. Of course, the uh, the people who know Australian cities is, uh, are all now giggling at that. The you yep. went to Adelaide and Perth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the complete opposite of every other recording artist. Yeah, they don't, <laughs> they don't go to Adelaide or Perth. I have to just go, you know, pay, you know, sort of pay my respects to ACDC and, and, uh, and you yep. know, that's sort of the main thing. That's it. And um, when you're in Perth, try to get up and go to, I always tell this to everyone, the stromatolites. They are coral rocks that have slime all over them. That's like a bacteria. They're the oldest living organisms on earth. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or you can just go visit Bon Scott's grave. Or you could do that. Oh, but I'll, I'll yeah. try and do both. Uh, yeah. you know, when else am I going to get chance to do both of those things at the same time exactly yeah, well, there's not much else to do in perth i'm gonna give you that <laughs> no, tell me about it I, I haven't actually been to perth but i've been to Fremantle, and i had the worst time but anyways it's not about that a huge thank you to duncan sheik for joining us i am so thrilled with how that episode turned out you can find him on the social medias i know it's twitter at the duncan sheik it's s-h-e-i-k 
You can find us at Thrash and Treasure or at Thrash and Treasure Podcast, depending on which service you are using. Also, did I say um, I knew Welcome to My Nightmare from The Muppet Show? I think it was season two, three or four. I don't know. It wasn't season one. Either way, I've got that on DVD and I've seen that episode like three times. So I do know that song. I think I said that. I don't know. I can't remember. I'm so tired. Also, thank you so much to JP from Musical Theatre Radio for his help putting together this episode whilst I was looking after my family with COVID. So huge thanks for that. Also, Depeche Mode. There was an album of covers which Rammstein appeared on with Stripped. Duncan then came to cover that song as well. So that was what all that was about. Anyways, lastly, depends on when you're listening to this episode. Uh, We're just waiting on a file of Duncan's latest single to play at the end. Um, But I'm really tired. I want to go to bed. So I'm just going to post it and then I'll fix it up once I've received the file. Because obviously it's the weekend. So... You know, that's all right. So if you're listening to this, depending on what theme you hear, if you hear our normal theme, then come back, search Duncan's music, and listen to it. Listen to the shit out of it. Anyways, so I guess that's it from us. Be sure to buy the Toniston Tales, support artists, go to the theatre, go see gigs, and to you guys at home, you take care, and we shall see you next time. Hooroo! Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's been a great honor. Like